want to start off just by asking you how Muharram or the coming of Muharram rather inspires your creativity. I know that you do a lot of work around the various uh, occasions related to the Al Bayt Alayhi Salam, you know, the births and the deaths. You know, you always release a, a, a piece uh, online on Instagram. Um, in Shah Ramadan, for example, you did the 99 Names of Allah, uh, which I'll ask you about, which seemed pretty intense, uh, a lot of work. Uh, so I can't wait to ask you about that. Um, but when Muharram is coming, uh, I guess, how does it inspire? Uh, your creativity given that you know you have a craft uh, and i feel like everyone who has a craft feels some sort of obligation to use that craft for Imam hussein um so if you can give me a brief breakdown on that for sure i think uh, over the years uh you know i i always had this intention to put out something for marking an event but over the last two three years i you know i would put more effort in because there's just so much emotion that gets captured during these first 10 nights and you know there's a lot of calligraphy out there, for example, you know, just entering a mosque, you know, you see, especially if it's a traditional center, you see all the banners and everything. And as the years went by, I, I wanted to create something that in invokes a certain emotion uh, just by looking at it, whether, you know, uh, a simple thing, you know, a simple narration from the Prophet, you know, Hussein, Umini, Wanam, Hussein, the simple things we often see every single year, but trying to capture it in a different way and, uh, making an experience for someone as they're scrolling down their feed. I feel like, I think Hassan would agree with me here as well, is that art for, you Your know, parents. I guess, <laughs> well, I think you'll be in this one. Uh, I think art now, when it comes to art throughout the Ahl Bayt specifically, is really flourishing uh, because I think the Shia community is a very new community uh, in the West, be it in the UK and the US. You know, a lot of us Definitely. are, uh, you know, first, second generation. Um, so, and I think you agree when it comes to uh, art depicting uh, Imam Hussein just generally it, it, it leaves sometimes dare I say this and I might get a lot of uh, flack for saying this it's sometimes even a lot to be desired um, but I feel like now we're in an age where um, art related to Muharram really is professional attractive uh, you know can it be appreciated by everyone um, so how do you think generally and Hassan I'll ask you for your thesis on this as well how do you think generally art related to the Ahl Bayt has, has evolved over the past uh, me a few years I say five six years I think uh, social media has helped a lot with that, to be quite honest. And we see different mediums, both, you know, different people taking the chance to, hey, you know, I have this talent. Let me put it out there and see, you know, and show this off to the world. At the same time, you have different uh, expressions of it. I, I think the, the most, the best thing I've seen, um, and I'm sure, I'm not sure where it's gone, you know, these days, but seeing a VR um, uh, display of the of the uh, 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 tragedy of, of Karbala and just seeing that because the, the reality is we want to see this event expressed in the highest of quality and standard and seeing you know something come to life which you could compare to like Pixar or DreamWorks or something you see on your uh, on on the mainstream TV and seeing hey we could display the uh, story of Muharram the same uh, 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 same, same quality quality that, that that's a win that you know that, that shows progress is happening mm, 100%. yeah and in regards to maharam in general um th my perspective of how i see it is it's always been um an artistic realm from the majalis itself is an artistic realm right um to like the poetry to like just the occasion to just like giving out food, right? So the whole uh, event of it is a art form, and that's kind of how I see it. How So it's always been artistic, right? Uh, but how it's evolved, and I, I know Zuhair mentioned, like where it's going based on technology, right? If technology is advancing, then yeah, we have a space in that. But how I see it evolving is now the non-Shias are coming in for Maharam. Now it's just like, what's happened i never knew about this now you have you know people from different sects within islam coming in and be like listen i'm gonna go sit in a 10-part lecture with sheikh fiaz at nyu and 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 you have you know individuals from the Sikh community that come in so that's where i see the evolution come that that's where i see the artistic form because um i've there's a lot of artwork that i've seen that are from non-muslims portraying imam Hussein. Mm. um and it's from their own perspective and again art is what you want to make it of there's no there's no restrictions in art right so the way the christian wants to commemorate imam hussein is going to be in his art form right um that's kind of how i see it evolving 
Uh, I appreciate you mentioning that because I, I actually wanted to ask this question as well. Um, I, I do feel like we're moving, uh, in terms of like a sectarian conversation, we're moving back toward, uh, dare I call it, the old age where, you know, Sunnis and Shias will kind of live side by side and commemorate Muharram together. Um, whereas now commemoration of Muharram is seen as to be a very Shia thing. You know, if you, if you commemorate Muharram, that means you're a Shia. Um, but, you know, flashback 100 years ago, back in Pakistan, let's say, for example, even in Iraq, the lines were a lot more blurred and even like going back centuries i think the lines were well it's always been a very you know mostly shia thing but i think the, the lines have historically been a lot more blurred and now i feel like as the younger generation is growing up uh who are less interested in these sectarian discourses and more interested in like uh you know uh working as a collective we see sunnis and shias coming together um and like i said even like non-muslims as well appreciating the message of imam hussein um so what i want to ask was here i'll ask you first how do you think yeah. uh the message of imam hussein can be elevated above the quote-unquote shia narrative where you can get to a level where you're expressing your love for ashura you're expressing your your commemoration of ashura but it's not seen to be a shia specific thing and this is a conversation i have with myself a lot as well so i want to hear your, your two cents on that yeah no i think we have to think about okay, you know what what have we what have we been doing the last you know ever since we can remember going to Majlis, you know the traditional thing that we've been doing in our that we're comfortable with, and as far as what can we do, you know how has this message impacted us, and maybe everyone ha will have a different avenue, but how do we market this to other people? You know, it's not it, it it's not Imam Hussein alayhi salam is not just for me and you, it, it's for everyone. But the reality is, you know, people aren't aware of his story, of his, of his, uh, the trial that he faced, and all of these different, you know, expressions which can be pulled from the story. I mean, every year we we go and we listen to different lectures, and there's a new layer that that gets built on top of what we learned last year, or maybe even throughout the year. And it's like, what can I pull? You know, the generosity of the Imam, or you know, there's so many different lessons you could pull, and how do I take this and make this like a capsule and you know, maybe this will benefit a certain community, but they, they are completely, you know, oblivious or they just don't know about Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And you have to find things which, you know, it's more easier to relate or build a story based on something you're comfortable with or, or, or have a um, experience with to pull that to a different community than, you know, just taking it head on where it, it could overwhelm me quite easily. You know, like, you know, a good example, who's, uh, who's was saying, you know, the, the past water bottles and things of this nature. And it's one way of doing it. But this, as the world gets smaller, you know, with social media and everyone, um, it's easier to, to build this bridge with other communities. Is it something you take into consideration whenever you're designing a piece? Like, do you ever think about, okay, how will someone who's not from my community appreciate this? And how does that affect your, your creative process? Oh, for sure. Like, like, just if I just focus on my Instagram account, I have followers from high school from, from from college and you know i always wonder you know, what are they what do they see in the other scrolling what, what kind of you know what do they think of this and and, and certain times someone will, will resonate with something and they'll you know leave a comment told their messages and it's like it's a door opens and i can have a, a dialogue with them and that's like when i when i've managed to do that you know it's like you know i feel great because it's like you know i i'm i'm creating this bridge with them and I always try to be cognizant of that even the translation if I if I use so it's something they can relate. It's not just this foreign thing that that they see and it's like, okay. Well, this has nothing to do nothing to do with me. I love that. I think uh, I'm definitely. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say um, just to just to add on to what Zuhair said about you know uh, relating to these high schoolers who are looking at his artwork and where's the re relationship there. Um, if you want, and my, this is 100% my opinion, I don't mean to be offensive in any way, this is kind of how I'd see it. But if you, like, going back to your question, how do you remake the message of Imam Hussein higher than where it is today? You have to give it to the hands of the youth, right? And, I mean, I'm 30, so I'm considered a youth, but I don't know how to use TikTok. Like, I don't know how to make these, these crazy videos. I'm just being honest with you. And if you, if we want to, and again, this is my opinion, I don't mean to be offensive, but if you want the message, message to reach beyond its borders now, the first thing that comes to my mind is how do we move the message into pop culture? How, that because how do we move that to the current culture that's that's overtaking the industry today, right? Mm. Um, so, for example, really quickly, uh, when Ali Alvi was here in New York and was running Who's Hussein here in New York, you know, him and the president at the time asked me, "Hey, can you make a small one minute?" They were like, "Can you make a five minute video?" To me, I was just like, "What do you want the video to be?" Like, oh, we want to promote Who's Hussein and we want to help from Maharam. I straight up told him, I was like, that doesn't make sense because Instagram, you need a one minute video. 
or mm -hmm. a 50, 59 second video, or if you want it on your store, you need 15 seconds. Yeah. But if I didn't have that trial and error, I wouldn't know how to promote it better. Um, because they were like, oh, we just want to put it on Instagram. Well, nobody's going to watch a five minute video. Attention span is a lot less than that. So that's what I mean by moving into palm culture, understanding, okay, we're going to make a video. Number one, that's how we're going to get to people. Number two, we're going to have to play with what we have right now. And that's how we would push the message moving forward. I just wanted to throw that in there. That's very interesting. I would say that, however, even like the whole framing of this conversation, this is something I think about a lot, just getting deep as you do, um, is that, you know, we always think about, okay, how can I spread the message? How can I, how can I relate to Mahal Saint to the, the non-Muslim and non-Shia and, you know, and, and but I think, I think we need to take a step back and think about, okay, before we have that conversation, how do we ourselves interpret this message? Because whatever we produce as art is going to come from within us, right? So, even with me, for example, I know, Zahir, you mentioned social media. I'm just scrolling through like our pages now. Um, I know you mentioned social media. Social media has definitely changed, you know, the outlook on, on everything. Yeah. Like on Twitter, for example, once I started getting, um, you know, following from not just people from my own community, but and not just people from outside the community, but like journalists, for example, or for example, um, filmmakers or, 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 you know, uh, actors and, 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 and pe people who are in different worlds to me are now following me. I can't now write the same way I used to write because it's like they, they might not um, I don't feel they'll resonate with it as much and, and, and really and truly it just it, it's, like, it's like the old days of you know, when, when you had the uh, Noha Khan who would sit and recite uh, to his people he would be the Noha Khan of the village a reciter who recites for the Quran I'm saying he would be a reciter who recites for the village now if you're a reciter you travel the world you know so I think generally the world's getting uh, much smaller and now even the way I write my poetry I'm like okay I'm writing it I'm writing it obviously because I want to express something but I'm also in a room now where there's not just my own, forget, not forget ethnicity or, or, or sect, not even my own community, people from right. all around the world who are listening oh. to this. How are they, how am I going to, how am I going to rewire the way I think so that I can connect with people uh, on a, on a, on, a, on a deeper level who aren't from my own circle. And I think that's where for me it starts. It's not about, okay, I want to repackage the message of what I'm saying and sell it and market it. For me, it's like, no, let, you need to rewire the way you think. Because you need to appreciate that you're in a smaller world now where you're in, where there are people from all across the spectrum who think differently to you. Um, and I think that's definitely something that's, that I've thought about a lot and, and, and the way I've kind of rewired my own uh, creative process. I don't know what you guys think of that. But that's, that's because your audience has changed and you have to go with the times when, when change happens, right? Like Zuhair's audience has changed when he first started. So now he has to rewire his artwork. My audience has changed, right? So all white people now, so I got to do something different. So... <laughs> Um, so it's, that's that's basically what art form is, you know. It's your your yeah. audience is always going to change. But but at what point does that hinder your your creative process? I guess that's the next question. Because you're not. Because again, like like I had this. Uh, uh, I was in this podcast recently, and I was speaking about this, and uh, I was saying it, it is a fact. It is a it, you know. I, I do want to um, preach to a preach. Do I use that word to a larger crowd? But at the same time, it's not just that. It's also the fact that I myself am. I'm changing. I myself am writing to what I want to write to, not just, which is why even my poetry has spread to beyond Ahl Bayt. If you look 10 years ago, that was never the case. Now it's, you know, writing about divine love and, and spirituality and social justice, um, not just because I feel it connects people more, but also because I want to. So I guess at what point does it, uh, does your does your audience hinder your creativity? Hasnain, I'll ask you that first. I don't think it ever will hinder your, your creativity personally. I think the, the, the challenge of constantly changing the audience will change your artwork. Um, as long as you stay true, this is what it is. As long as that challenge is still there, there's no hindrance to it. Because the thing is, uh, and the best way to put this is, I'll give an example, like Sheikh Fiaz, right? He'll always ask me, like, hey, Hasnan, like, like, what should I talk about for Maharam? Like, what, what are my lectures should be? We've heard so many of it already. So give us something refreshing. So he was just like, that's the challenge that we, 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 we take on, right? We have to constantly come up with new topics and then kind of question the topics, like go into debate with the topics on your own to figure out what's the best way to de deliver it. So it changes like that. But the lecture is never bad. It's just, it's a new audience. It's a new challenge. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like a breath of fresh air. But it's just the same thing. Like your poetry, it's you. Your style is the same. But your words might be different or your message might be different or what you're talking about might be different. But you stay true to yourself. Your art's just changing and your honest is changing. And, and that is, that's not a hindrance to you. Um, Zuhair, your perspective. I'd say it's easy to uh, 
for things to get watered down it, it, when you when your audi- audience changes you may think oh you know i need to shift away yes i think what the most important thing is staying true to yourself and the intention of why you're doing doing, doing x and hey like you know the audience is changing this is just another opportunity from god like hey the it's like you're getting the audience is expanding different people are coming in and it's like yes you you have to it's, take a step back like okay i've been doing this for the last two years you know or, or whatever it is maybe you know i need to just you know recalibrate what why i'm doing this in the first place and expand and to make sure it's um whatever you're doing let's uh, for, for example in my case if if it is calligraphy or if it is art just try to make sure that it's both the intention is there but also it comes off in um in a way which captures in the, uh, all the entire crowd where everyone can relate to love that uh, and uh Hussain, j- j- just going off your point as well um and i think this is what i'm talking about this is something i'm very passionate about by the way so forgive me if i get fiery <laughs> but um that whole uh what are we going to talk about muharram kind of conversation um sheikh fiaz sf we can call him because we're close to him um i call um, him sf <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna start i'm gonna start calling him SF as well um who we all love um you know gives wonderful talks and to be honest with you it frustrates me a lot when I see the kind of uh, speeches uh, uh, sheikhs and says in our community are given sometimes because I feel like, like you said, there is this there is this uh, element of just retreading uh, what you've already spoken about before, which I think is fine, you know, like lessons about Islam and uh, akhlaqi stuff and, and marriage. And, and, and these are all things that will help us in life. But my issue is that we fail to realize that now in this world that we live in, the 10 days of Muharram is our pulpit and the world is smaller. So it's our opportunity to uh, to speak about issues that aren't that aren't specific to our own bubbles. Like I said, we're no longer living in villages anymore. It's no longer about the the in, infighting that we have in our community. It's no longer about uh, the, the 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 social issues that are specific to that town, let alone our Shia community. Um, right. But our speakers, I feel like, are not don't seem to understand that this world now is small. What are the biggest issues that the world is talking about, or at least the West is talking about? Black Lives Matter. Is one African Americans are getting shot, you know, for being black. Uh, you have uh, Native American oppression. You have systemic uh, systemic Islamophobia. You know, you have so many issues that even f- going away from the social justice arena, you have issues that all kind of youth are facing growing up in a society where they don't really understand themselves, where they're facing depression. These are issues that affect all of us. These are issues that we need to be that need to be tackled. Um, and really and truly, the ten days of Muharram is our opportunity because you know, uh, it's the time where uh, our, 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 our scholars really get the most ear. It's the time where they, they heard the most. It's really our opportunity um, to to tackle these real issues that all of us are facing, not just within our community. And it really, really, really frustrates me because as we know, as we've spoken about since the beginning, the message of Imam Hussein is not specific to the Shia, like it or not. It, it, that's just a reality. Um, and uh, even though, you know, uh, certain communities uh, or, or I guess people might might, might try to uh, spin it differently that is the reality you know he didn't, he didn't he, 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 it's an important part of his like, history and his like, heritage and his lessons are, are universal um so i don't know if you guys agree with me on that or share my kind of grievances i, I think i think my rebuttal to that would be um there's a big difference um in my and this is just again my opinion there's a big difference between what the the sheikhs that are traditional in urdu or punjabi speaking are saying Versus those who have the power to lecture in English, and you're knowing that all speak, eyes are on I'm, them. I'm I think about, English lectures. I'm speaking about English speakers, by the way, not like Urdu or Punjabi or Arabic. Oh, okay. Specific English. Well, I mean, I, I, I feel like, um, again, my opinion, that um, SF, along with a few others, have been doing a significantly better job speaking about those topics and correlating it with, with uh, Imam Hussein's message. Because... Um, like last year, I, I, that's calling kind of all I've been hearing about is just like the correlation of modern times, what's going on today. How do we stand up for it today? You know, you know, I'd go a step further. I know Nuri is referring to just English speakers, but I think the the the, the problems that are that we're facing as a society, it doesn't stop. Like I mean, I, I again, I, I try to stay, you know, uh, alert what's going on in the world, but I know there's things happen in Pakistan you know, as, as well, even Iraq if we just you know let's put English to a side for a second you know anyone can re- relate to it so even it's not just that English speakers should be only focusing but I agree completely the topics need to be kept with the times if, if you have a speakers that are dedicating 
you know, most of the lectures to like the same old just recycling last year. They use, they, I don't know what, I, at this point, I don't know what the, I, I, I don't even know who's sitting under, under them, to be quite honest. I have seen, you know, nowadays, the last two years, I'll see speakers come up with like um, flyers that have the topics for each lecture. And I, I, I've been reading the last the two days, I've been seeing some good topics, actually. So it is encouraging. But I'd say, you know, it's not just English speakers. I think everyone that goes in the pulpit, yes, these are the 10 days where you get maximum exposure. You need to speak about anything and everything. You know, there's no, sure, maybe a fraction of the things, you know, it's not, you know, it may be taboo to speak. But most of the things out there, you know, there's no reason not to speak about it. And I think, you know, that's the time when, you know, speakers need to put their foot down and if, You'll have, you know, all the, all the local politics. Oh, we can't talk about this. It's Muharram. No, you know, it needs to be spoken about because if it's not spoken about, then it'll be sh- it'll be uh, shoved under under the rug until un- it'll never be spoken about. Yeah, I mean, even the taboo taboo topics should be spoken about. I mean, there sh- there shouldn't even be like, oh, we don't want to really enter this realm. I mean, to be yeah. fair, nothing's ta- uh, nothing's ta- nothing's taboo in Islam. Basically, yeah, basically, yeah, basically. Yeah. Spoke about nothing's taboo. I'm just yeah. giving the benefit of the doubt to the to the few. <laughs> but you know, I, I think honestly, it's uh, and I'll just end with my last two cents on this on the subject. Um, it, it's just about reframing your your the way you look at things, and it's just about appreciating the fact that hey, we live in this this society now, this Western society, where we're interconnected with everyone who's unlike us, be it the Sunni or the non-Muslim or the the Sufi or you know. Um, uh, the atheists, for God's sake, you know, we're, 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 we're all interconnected now. And I think we need to appreciate that this is the world that we live in. Uh, and we need to kind of rewire the way you think accordingly. I think that's, that, that's very important. And that is one of the challenges of not just limited to the Shia community, I think Islam in general, um, you know, Muslims in the West in general, that we're, we're really for the first time in history uh, over the past 60, 70 years living under what would be classified as a kafir, quote unquote, society. Um, and it's like, how do you, how do you kind of uh, find your footing in that environment, because historically we've always, Muslims have generally lived under caliphates, right, under quote-unquote Islamic societies. Um, so I think really that's what the conversation is about uh, more than anything. Zahir, I was scrolling through your, your profile and I, and I just remember that we always kind of uh, inadvertently collaborate uh, on, on various pieces because you, you, a few times you've taken some of my, my poems and, and made the wonderful, beautiful images out of them uh, without asking me, not that you need to ask me, uh, because you know I always like to see them. <laughs> but uh, uh, I tell this, you something's coming. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. Uh, this one was wonderful um, that you did about my uh, couplet about uh, commemorating at home last year, because obviously last year was during coronavirus. Uh, it was one of the first times in, in, yeah. in I guess, since the last pandemic, hundred years ago, where uh, so many of us were kind of stuck to commemorating our show at home because of lockdown and everything. Um, I guess how does uh, to what extent do external factors, um, be it my poetry or be it anything else, um, generally in life, uh, affect the way you or inspire you to to design something? Um, I heard uh, one of my creative friends uh, told me um, a few, I guess it was like a year or two ago, that the secret to creativity is that everyone's copying everyone. <laughs> so he's like, whenever you or, or I guess emulating would be the right word. Like, he goes, whenever you want to make a video, for example, always look at an example to how to how to what you're going to kind of emulate when you're going to make an art piece look at what the trends are to kind of emulate that so to what extent does uh, external do, do external factors impact your 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 your, your art craft and your design process i think to an extent the emulate the emulation factor is there um you you I, i'm always looking at anything and everything to gain inspiration from even if it's you know it's, it's not related to calligraphy and i think uh, in that case the piece that, I, that you're referring to i did I, I know I just read it and it's like something, so, so, sometimes some things are so literal that I can easily conceive an image in my head. And I'm like, I need to put this on paper. Like I, that, that uh, last year I had done, I think three pieces. I was like, this is it. Like, this is the three pieces I'm going to do for the, these 10 nights. And um, that I saw your poetry. And I was like, and I, I was feeling really, you know, down. I mean, just like everyone was because who wants to commemorate, you know, these nights sitting behind the screen at home. You know, you want to be in, in, in a medjus. And I read that, you know, it really re- uh, resonated. So I, I, I had to, you know, come up with something. But there are times where, you know, there's things all around me and I can't find, like like now, I can't, I can't find anything to make. Or rather, there's, there's, there's many things to make, but it's not, it's just 
doing it just for the sake of and I don't believe in that. I, I, I If I make a piece, I need to be happy with it or at least content with it. And uh, if, uh, unless or I just abandon the idea, you know, sometimes the idea is there, but there's not enough time or it's just not coming together properly. So I just I'm like, I, I, I it needs the essence of it needs to be there. And I need to be content with it. if it's not, then I just I rather not put it out at all. I love that. I feel like I'm speaking to myself uh, <laughs> the way you're speaking about uh, your, your challenges. I, I saw you tweet the other day that um, I think it was for Eid al Ghadir. <laughs> you were trying to uh, design something. You're like, I can't think of an idea and I, I, can't, I can't put anything together. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Did you end up doing something? I, I forget. I, I did, but it wasn't what I had in mind. And I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to tell you the idea. I want to show you guys it, inshallah, when it comes up. But yeah, I, I, I even... T- the one thing I, I made was the last night. The night before, I was like, okay, either either, either I do something or I don't. And I really want to put something out, but sometimes you know, it's, just, it's just not happening and you need to be patient with it. It was amazing, by the way. This is the Allah Muhammad Ali, right? That was, yeah. It was incredible. Hasnain, did you see this one? Thank you. Hasnain, did you see this one? <laughs> is it blue and gold? The blue and gold one, yeah. With yeah, like yeah. A pillar I mean, it is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it. I'm I'm his number one fan. He's my number one fan. It's, it's, it goes That's both true. ways, man. Yeah. Um. So I guess what I want to ask you was how how do you overcome that that kind of like their oh, writer's man. block? I mean, a lot a lot of people ask me that question as well. How how do you overcome uh writer? I have my own kind of methods, but uh, how does it work for you? Uh you know, I try different things. Um. Uh, I'll. Uh, I'll take a break, you know, from everything. You know, if it's not working out, you know, I'll meditate. I'll go by the water. Going by the water really helps a lot. But um, I, if I'm in a rut, like a like um, co- continuous, like like I'm trying to make something, and it's not happening. Sometimes I, there's nothing I, I can do about it. I have to like ride it out. It's a wave that comes, and if it's not working out, then I just you keep. What often happens is I keep trying and trying and trying. And it's just not, it's like resisting. And I, at that point, I know it's like, I can't force it out. And, you know, I just have to, you know, like just maybe like there are times where my feed goes empty for weeks or months. And I hate it because I want to, I want to, you know, put stuff out. But if it doesn't happen, I just, patience is the, is the only thing, thing I, I could think of because you don't want, uh, and then even the, the one that I, piece that I, I did, Prof. Eid al-Ghadir, I didn't think the concept was strong, but the execution I was content, not happy. You're and insane, bro. This is unbelievable. <laughs> and but the, the, beautiful. The Whoever perfectionism. Which was posted uh, six days ago from now. It was like like thirtieth of July. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, like, I mean, um, so so now I know why my commissions take forever because <laughs> you're always yes. in a rut when I tell you to do something. I get it. Okay. Or the perfectionist factor. That's the thing. It, it's a curse and it's a blessing. So that's mm. that. That's really. Um, that's really what it is. Hasnain, I, I face that too, by the way. You know, when people like ask me for poems, like I, 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 I drive people insane. Uh, and a reciter uh, who shall not be named, uh, a good friend of all of us, <laughs> asked me for a poem from Muharram. It took me two months to get a poem, two months, because I, I just yeah. couldn't. I could, it, it's like a, you're asking me essentially to, to write what comes from my heart on the spot, and it, it doesn't really work like that. I, some, for some people, it does. Uh, for me, yeah. it, it most definitely doesn't. So I, I can see definitely where it's coming from. Yeah, it's not a button you just press and you know it gets delivered next day. But. Um, I'm gonna uh shift gears a little bit, and if that's okay with you, I kind of want to talk more about um, you know, keep it light about you like your your job, which is you know, an architect, um, because there's also an artistic form in what you do from there. I know you had a Jonathan Bucky project that you did quite a, quite a while ago. I know you were working on some projects uh, in Garbal or Najaf where you were designing, you know, like a, like a, just a sample stuff like that. Um, you know, how, how do you go about that? Like, like you know, obviously um, I know you very well um, and I know that you're a fine architecture uh, architect. Um, so, so, sorry. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just, you know, it's kind of yeah. where I want to go. Like how, like how, how does, how does the vision of, designing a building or a structure come in come into your head and how do you get that onto wood and a board yeah you know um the the greatest i think the greatest achievement i've done from an architecture side it has been the baki project uh to, to uh, just to give you guys a, a quick uh, snapshot i the the last year of college was a thesis year and you could do whatever you want at least that's what i thought 
Um, I first week of uh, uh, we get into class and the prompt was affordable housing in New York City, which is a great idea. But I was like, I'm not. I don't want to do this. I want to work uh, on this project, and I had to basically sell my professor on the idea, like that there's problems to solve with the with the uh, baqi. And the summer before that, I had gone the first time I had gone to Ziara in Iraq, and I, that's something I really wanted to do. And after a week of convincing, I um, I managed to. He, he's like, okay, let's do it. I spent four months researching it, uh, just ideas and what's the, what can happen, and uh, researching different. Uh, architect, Islamic architecture th throughout the Islamic world, and then I spent four months designing it. So in that case, I mean, I you know you you think okay, let me just rebuild what used to be here, or you know my professor really helped me design outside the box and making something that was different, um, you know reinterpreting uh, traditional Muslim architecture into something more contemporary. But that's probably the one, uh, either that or like uh, competitions. You are the only designer, so you can dictate how things go. In the real life, you know, your, your uh, budget, money, you know, time, all these things come into play. And sometimes, um, you know, I mean, you, you have an idea and if it doesn't fly with the client and, you know, it's just not going to work. But um, I think that's, you know, that's the thing. That's the, you know, your job and what you have to do. What helps is doing competitions on the side. Like I've done two competitions for... Um, uh, a uh, youth house in, in Medina in southern Baghdad or a affordable housing sorry not affordable housing, affordable but also sustainable housing in Mosul post ISIS so mm -hmm. doing these things on the side helps like hey I want to design X and Y but I know I can't do this in real life so the competitions help with that the, crea uh, the creative outlet how does your and I feel like they seem like such opposite words but well worlds but I feel like they're also very uh, they almost mirror each other. How does your your, your love and your passion for architecture uh, correlate with your your love and passion for calligraphy? Hmm. I think that's an interesting question. I know that answer. I'm full of them. Huh? I said I'm full of them. I'm full of interesting questions. Yeah. I I think you know they are. You're right. In, in a way, one is a lot more abstract. Actually, they both can be abstract, but one is more. You know, by the end of the result, for example, architecture, things, I don't want to say get dumbed down, but we, the technical term is value engineered. Things, you know, there may be a fraction of what you had originally conceived in your head of what it could possibly be. Unless it's like, you know, a budget, a project that has an insane budget and it could be crazy like and, and it could do whatever you want. Calligraphy, on the other hand, I'm there's, there's, there's no, most of the time there's no restrictions uh, aside, you know, just the rules of you know you, uh, of calligraphy and you you have a lot of freedom in and playing with that and it's more like you know there's no one on you know on top of me of how things need to get designed or need, need unless it's for a client and some clients can be really can be really um difficult but we make it work um that's I, I'd say th those are those are, and, and it's fun you know if you if at work you, I have to deal with these constraints. And then work, when the work is done, you know, that's my, uh, calligraphy is my hobby. I just get to do whatever I want for the most part. You know, it, it's very interesting. You reminded me of, uh, before Hassan jumps in, that there's a story of, um, uh, there was a great man who had passed away now, Dr. Sayyid Muhammad Ali Shahristani. I don't know if you heard of him. Uh, I believe he was an architect. He might have been a scientist, I'm not sure. Um, but really? he, he was so interesting because he, there's a documentary about him online. If you search his name and search Ahl Bayt TV, you can find it. Um, but basically he, um, he was a, uh, a student of the seminary, so he, he, he kind of surpassed his, his uh, Islamic studies, and then he became a, a scientist or an architecture, or I think one mm. or two. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to mention him, because there's a very interesting story of when he's repairing um, uh, the two domes of Imam Qadam's shrine in, in, Qadami, in Qazmain. And there's a story of him, he's uh, basically uh, adjusting one of the pillars uh, for the dome. Um, and, he, and, he, and if I'm hoping I'm misquoting the story, but he says that there was a, a chance where he had to like, let it go and hope that it kind of was stable and in that moment the whole thing could have literally collapsed or it would have stayed uh, above and he goes i chose to have faith that it would stay uh, uh stay kind of steady and the reason i find that story so interesting is that it kind of collates all these different worlds faith uh you know science uh, architecture uh, and also uh you know uh, religion and I, I, just, I i find that such such an interesting story and i think there's so much that you can do with architecture uh, in that realm and honestly bro i think you're going to go inshallah very far uh, with it, Hasnain, sorry, you had a question. 
Yeah, I just I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you know, um, so here you're you're a triple threat. Uh, you're a beautiful Quran spider. You are a amazing calligrapher, um, and you're a very skilled, you know, art. Very you kind know. of you. And let uh, me listen. I'm a I'm kind person. Amazing know? guy as well. So it's four. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that too, that too. We'll, we'll see, we'll see that too. Um, <laughs> we'll see. So basically, you know, like, um, did, was your calligraphy inspired by, um, you know, your uh, the Quran? Because I, I, you know, I know that that's a very sacred spot in your heart. Um, I don't have to get into to the nitty gritty, but I, I know, you know, you learn from your father and and whatnot. And it's a very intimate thing to you so I, I you know i would say the calligraphy came from that and the architect came from opening up the mind when it came to design and arts and stuff like that so can you just take us on that path from one to another yeah you know i, I want to tell you guys a story when i was maybe you know 10 or 11 i can't remember exactly when i was really young i would draw if there was like a waladat or something coming up i would draw these pieces and go put, put the, the mosque had this uh what do you call it? like those boards you know that put announcements and I would just go pin it on there. No one told me to do it. You know, I just, that was my, you know, I was like, I could do this. Let me go, you know, put this up there. Years later, I think, uh, um, I own, like, I, I, when it comes to specific to call calligraphy, I experimented a little during architecture school and I stopped because I no longer had the time. But the Quran definitely played a role because, I mean, just you go to museums, you hear all the Qurans. I mean, that's for, you know, I guess for people who, I guess, wouldn't have as much ex exposure. But when you open the Quran, you know, just, the, the way that the calligraphy goes the lines I mean it, it all of these have an impact you know it's uh, something and I, I, I mean I have pieces that I first started and they and I mean I, they'll never see the light of day but they weren't I mean even to, I mean I don't consider myself an expert in any regard in the calligraphy but all, I think it's a culmination of all these little things where you know it's like how can I I know I have the skill that Allah has given me the skill and how do I push this further because all of these skills you know whether it's recitation or you know uh, architecture or clean, they're all gifts and it's like I, I i have to give them back it's I, I have a responsibility that you know like i feel like god has given me these skills and i have to somehow give it back and to me there's multiple ways of you know giving back but the one that has the most value is you know spreading you know which is why most of my pieces like i know poetry and calligraphy go a lot together but unless the poetry has to do with, you know, the Ahlul Bayt Ali the Islam, I think this is like the most valuable and has the most value because the way I see it, there's so many things you can spend your time doing, but you want to dedicate towards that which will bring more value. With it, whether it's in this life or the hereafter, and I think that's like the avenue I try to focus in on as much as I can. I'm very much in a state of mind now where um, I had this conversation a lot with myself. Um, I guess because I, I think too much maybe, but um, <laughs> I, I, I'm i in this state of mind now where it's like, there's no point in producing art if it's not going to be riveting. Uh, and I hope that statement doesn't come back and bite me when I produce something that's not riveting. <laughs> but honestly, I think, I think because, because we're in like, uh, there's two things. One, we're in a social media age where, like you said, you mentioned earlier, you need to post all the time. And unfortunately you do sometimes to, to try and be kind of relevant and, and have your engagement up. You have to keep posting and that's yeah. what that you fall into. And therefore, uh, I fell into this trap too. You, you, you produce things that are almost subpar, they're not good enough, um, just to keep your feed going. Um, and secondly, you know, we come from uh, a very beautiful culture, um, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, serving the message of Mahomet Singh culture, where if you're a reciter, you're reciting at every occasion. You know, you're, cont you're continuously reciting new poems. Um, uh, and, and as a result, uh, similar to that kind of social media dilemma, you're continuously consistently uh, trying to um, uh, to up yourself and therefore not everything you produce is, um, might be, uh, dare I use the words, uh, up to par, even though you're still getting the the, the reward and the edge for it, um, uh, inshallah, in the hereafter. So I guess, where's the line between, um, and this is something I'm asking you to advise me on, Sahir, uh, where's the line between, I want to produce something that's good enough, I want to produce something that I can, you know, I think is riveting that will actually shape people and move people versus it's Muharram or it's an occasion and you got to put something out because you've got a duty. How do you find the, the fine line between those two? Uh, it's just interesting you ask me this, especially since I'm going through this rut. And first of all, I'm no expert in this, you know, or just even I have no um, to even advise. But as you as you asked me this question, I thought about when I first produced like three pieces from Muharram two years ago, I just did it out of like, oh, I have this idea, let me just do it. And it, it was really well received. 
And now three years later, I'm like, I'm just sitting, you know, looking at my drawing board and, and I can't come up with anything. And it's like, do I, you know, how, and I, and I, I, I know it's, it's, it's sort of like, oh, I have to match last door. Or I have to, this is caliber. I have to match. And I think at the end of the day, if uh, the biggest thing is, you know, you ask yourself, uh, uh, is there any, any sincerity in, in this and I think, and I know, you know, we're all, um, you know, no one's ma'asum, no one's infallible. You do fall into, you know, into like, you know, is it just for the, the, the is it just for the world? Is it, the, how sincere is it? You know, and most of the time you can answer that question uh, of how, if it's there or if it's not, or how can you, because at the end of the day, you, you know, no one's really putting this piece of poetry as art out, you know, like, oh, next thing you, you know, there's like a paycheck that comes along with it. No, it's, the, the whole point is to get, you know, for the pleasure of Allah and you know his, his representatives, so it's like, okay. You know what? Maybe and this, most of the time this does happen. You take a step back, recalibrate, and come like you know if I if I if I can't produce that, I'll produce something. But my intention is you know I have this gift. I want to you know display this to the world and 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 you just keep it true to yourself. That's it's, it's maybe a cliche statement and simple, but that's what it really comes down to. It's interesting. There's a story that I think about a lot. A uh, very old school story uh, it took place like it's the early 1900s. Um, so if whoever's been to Karbala will notice obviously that the shrine is in itself and you have buildings around it. But back in the days, uh, the way the city was built was that houses were attached to the shrine. So people would have houses that were actually connected to uh, the courtyard of, of Imam Hussein's shrine. And what happened was that the shrine wanted to expand. So what they would do was they would buy out all the houses, demolish them and expand the shrine. And there was one house left. Uh, I don't think one house left or I, I guess one guy that they approached and the guy was like, no, I'm not giving you my house. There's no way I'm giving you my house. It's not happening. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing the story. Uh, and so he wouldn't take the, he, he wouldn't let them buy him out, buy out his house. He came back nine months later. He goes, here's the keys. Uh, take the house for free. And they're like, what happened? He goes, when you asked me for my house, my house wasn't in good shape. And if I want to give something toward Imam Hussein, it has to be of top shape. So I spent nine months renovating it making sure it's the best house possible. And then I gave you the key so you can take it. So that Imam Zayn knows that I gave him the best. Um, so that's something I think about a lot in, in that, you know, when we're interesting. serving Imam Hussein or serving God generally, or just putting art out there, you know, even like putting religion aside, is it the best that you can do? Um, and, and that's a debate I ask myself all the time. And I, I produce stuff that, you know, have gone very far. I did not think was good. I produce stuff that is not good and hasn't gone far. Um, and it, it, it's tough, man. Even like this Muharram, for example, I haven't, made any uh spoken word poem which i've been doing for every single year I just, number one because i really haven't really had the time because i've got a lot of work on right now but number two because i couldn't really crack it i couldn't think about anything that i really wanted to, to, to put together um might do some stuff after ashura but i guess that's the continuous debate that i'm having uh, in my head all the time and hopefully i'll meet someone uh, who will manage to uh, guide me uh, through this uh, incredibly insane uh, process um winding down uh, a question that we ask all of our uh, uh, guess and is about the relationship between their art and their spirituality. Um, obviously, your art is very Islamic. It's very overtly Islamic. You know, it's about the Ahl Bayt. It's about you know, you've got 99 names of Allah, which I did want to ask you about, um, but hopefully we'll save it another time. Uh, which, if anyone hasn't seen, uh, check out Zahir's Instagram page. Uh, I can't believe you produced 99 names of Allah. Uh, did you do it in Ramadan or? So I, I haven't done all 99 yet. I'm okay, close. So you did a lot. Have, how, how, yeah. How, how many did you post in Ramadan? This is the third Ramadan I've done it, but what's happened is, so the first Ramadan I started it, I was actually in Iraq for most of the Ramadan, and I and then I, I sort of lost steam because I was I was traveling. I was like, okay, well, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I did my best last year, and then last year um, I, I was doing it, and then um, like towards the end of it, my father passed from COVID, and I just okay. I just took a break, and then this, and then I was like, I need to complete this. So this Ramadan I did all. 30 days I, I posted something so I think if I remember correctly I have maybe 20 or 30 names remaining so, so what, in Ramadan were you doing it every single day like designing so the, so the, so the, so here's the thing this and this comes back to your other question the calligraphy itself I did the weeks before okay but, but the text is the this was the most difficult part because I didn't just put the, the I was I, I wanted to give more than just a calligraphy. I want to have a reflection and I you didn't did, want. Yeah, I just I I noticed that every single post you had a, like a nice long reflection about the. Yeah, name. and and I most of them I did during the I, I would do like every day because I didn't want to just you know I wanted to give it some thought. There are some days I I couldn't come up with anything and, and I was like you know what let me give it a rest. You know I wanted it to be to be meaningful, not just to post and you know put some blurb just for the sake of. So 
in that case, yeah, I, I would spend, you know, I, I had to pick three days, um, three days before to make sure I had enough for the, for the posts, but I would spend the day uh, writing that up and post it. It reminds me when I, when I, um, I don't mean to keep bringing the conversation back to me, but it reminds <laughs> me when I, uh, I did the 73 verses about Imam Hussein and I started, I think it was around his birth, birth before his birth anniversary. And I just kind of like, like 30 verses in, I'm like, wait, I can't do this anymore. It's too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of like dropped it and hope everyone forgot about it. And then I, alhamdulillah, I managed to, to, to complete it um, just before Muharram last year. And alhamdulillah, it, it was really well received because it, not only did it come, I think, from a, from a good place. And it's interesting because when I put it out there, I was like, this is, this is all right. This is not really going to go go far. I just kind of put it out there and, and, and see where it went. But people really resonated with it. I think because it came from a place of, of sincerity, not from a place of, oh, I want to make something amazing. It's going to change the world. It's like, no, this is true to me. Yeah, um, that's what people really uh, kind of connect to most. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry, we we're speaking about art and spirituality. So yeah, what I was going to ask you was that obviously your your artwork is is very overtly spiritual. You know, you're, it's very overtly Islamic. Um, but at the same time, I guess the relationship between art and spirituality differs between person to person. We have so many different people that come on this podcast of uh, you know all across the Muslim spectrum who for whom spirituality means different things. For you specifically, Zahra Hosseini, what relationship? Does art have your art have with your spirituality? I think I've in the past I I would go towards you know this feeling I wanted to crave you know I I put out a piece where I come up with a piece and um I always wanted you know it was just these spiritual highs which I which I would take from from it or you know I I was in a spiritual high and therefore I will make this piece and now it's just it's become you know. I, if I'm not in a spiritual high, I still want to put out art. Or it, it, it depends, you know. For example, if if, if it's like an occasion, a waladat or you know, a shahadat, an imam, I I, I want him. It's something for the world or you know to put out there. But less, I guess, for me. It, although it's still you know significant. There's other times where you know I, I'm going through something, and you know I come across a narration or a verse or something I probably read a hundred times, but it, it only resonated then. And you know, you know, it's, it's more of a reminder to me than you know. But I still put it out because you know, it, and I've realized that months later or even years later, I go back and I refer to this. I remember everything that happened then, and you know, it's it's like a bookmark, you know, of you know referencing you know a moment, uh, something that happened in life or something, you know, a down moment, whatever it is. But even though yes, it is on a social media, you know, audience, but it's. It's more for me, and, and th- those are usually cases, you know, if it's like a hadith from the imam or um, just something that really resonates uh, uh, at that point, something uh, a lesson to take to take from. Love it. Has things already? Has something to say? You unmute yourself. No, no, I was just yeah. gonna say it's 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 amazing to see how across all different artistic forms we find therapy within within the art form itself. Big time. Um, and before I let you go through here, because you travel to so many places, what's your favorite place of travel? Uh, spiritual or any any? Oh, I can't answer that. I can't. Architecture. Architectural. You went to you Ar- went to the, you went to the Grand Canyon recently, right? I did. Oh, that's, that, that's God. That's God's architecture, bro. I think. Gra- God's oh, Gra- oh, oh I cannot. You it's know, like one of my dream locations. Photos. Honestly, you see photos here and there, right? Magazines, Everyone videos. Yeah. Photos are nothing. Honestly, you go and like I was driving, like I, I was driving there, and I wasn't at the park yet, yet. But you're in the, you know, the, the 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 surroundings, and I'd stop before I reached the main part, and I'm just looking out. I'm like, "There's how, like how, I like, oh, it's photos do nothing, and and when you stand there, it's just that, yeah, that is God's architecture, and you know, it, it just I, I I can't even talk about it. It's just like you stand there, and it really takes you uh, back, and I, and I even I did some hiking. And I would have gotten. Some people go hike all the way to the bottom, which because you know, I'm not an uh, expert hiker, so I, I can never do that. I mean, shallow one day, but, but it, it's it's just it's just it's just crazy how that's probably you know, uh, yeah. I, Grand Canyon is just one one of one of a kind. Honestly, you have uh, to go and see it for your I'm own. To go. I'm gonna go next year. Hasni, you wanna come with me? Inshallah, we'll take a Ziyad trip there. <laughs> just go. <laughs> don't go in the summer. That's that's the only really? thing. That yeah. was a crazy hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's even worse now. But when I went, it was, it was manageable. And if you hike, f- like start after Fajr, don't by ten o'clock you can't. You'll you wow. won't make it. I can imagine it doesn't, man. That's crazy. <laughs> um, 
Zahir, appreciate you so much. Uh, if Thank people want to follow me. you and see and, and, and find your work online, where, where can they follow you? Where can they get in touch? Uh, my website is ZuhairH.com and my Instagram are the two main places. They, they, so everything I post there ends up on my website. So yeah, my Instagram and my website are the two main places. And then Twitter, thoughts here and there if you want to hear how frustrated I am. If I, I can't make a piece, you'll, you'll on the, uh, at uh, Zuhair. No, The Reciter. That's my Twitter handle. Zuhair, appreciate you, bro. Take Thank care. you so See much. You, Take care. Inshallah. Inshallah.